Good morning. Welcome as we gather together in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome family and friends as we gather. We are delighted to have you here in person and on Facebook Live. It is good to be with one another in God's presence. Today is the seventh Sunday after Epiphany and uh, we will be reflecting on Luke's gospel, a uh, call to love our enemies. Um, just a brief reminder to let you know this would be a great time to go ahead and begin to open your communion uh, just a little bit so that at the appropriate time it'll be a little bit easier to access. Um, are there any other announcements that need to be made? If not, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship with a silent prayer and a prelude. May we rise as you are able for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates us, redeems us, and calls us by name. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, 
we confess that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves. We have failed to show hospitality to those you called us to welcome. Accept our repentance for the things we have done and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and lead us that we may bathe in the glory of your Son born among us and reflect your love for all creation. Amen. Rejoice in this good news. In Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You are descendants of the Most High, adopted into the household of Christ and inheritors of eternal life. Live as freed and forgiven children of God. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord Jesus, make us instruments of your peace that where there is hatred, we may so love. Where there is injury, pardon, and where there is despair, hope. Grant, O oh divine master, that we may seek to console, to understand, and to love in your name. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading comes from the 45th chapter of Genesis. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life, for the famine has been in the land these last two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall saddle in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your households and all that you have will not come to poverty. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will read Psalm 37 responsively. Do not be provoked by evildoers. Do not be jealous of those who do wrong. For they shall soon wither like grass, and like the green grass fade away. Put your trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and find safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, who shall give you your heart's desire. Commit your way to the Lord. Put your trust in the Lord and see what God will do. The Lord will make your vindication as clear as the light and the justice of your case like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently. Do not be provoked by the one who prospers, the one who succeeds in evil schemes. Refrain from anger, leave rage alone, and do not be provoked. It leads only to evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who hope in the Lord shall possess the land. In a little while the wicked shall be no more. 
Even if you search out their place, they will not be there. But the lowly shall possess the land. They will delight in abundance of peace. But the deliverance of the righteous comes from you, O Lord. You are their stronghold in time of trouble. You, O Lord, will help them and rescue them. You will rescue them from the wicked and deliver them, because in you they seek refuge. The second reading comes from the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body do they come? Fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the physical and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the sixth chapter. But I say to you that, listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes, uh, takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even the sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies. Do good. And lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. The Gospel of the Lord. 
You may be seated if children will come forward for children's time. Good morning. How you doing? Good to see you this morning. Do you know that last Monday was a... What is it, Valentine's Day? Woohoo! I happen to have a Valentine's Day balloon. Y'all like balloons? I like balloons. Balloons are fun. Yeah, it always pops, yeah. And I don't want to let this one go because guess where it'll end up? It'll, you're right. It'll end up way up there. It'll hit the light and pop. Well, let's not do that. That's a good idea, right? Okay. Well, so Valentine's Day. Why do, why do we celebrate Valentine's Day? Yeah. That's right. We, we give Valentine's to other people. Do we give them to people we like? Do we give Valentine's to people we like? People we love. love. Do we give them to people we really hate? Yeah. No. But that's part of today's lesson. God said that we are supposed to love everybody, even the people we don't like very much, even our enemies, even those people that we just can't stand and we just hate them. But God reminds us with a heart that he made everything, right? Is there anything that God didn't make? No, God makes everything. And God loves the whole world. Right? How much of the world does God love? The whole world. So God says, I want you to love everybody. Even the people we don't like very much. Because what happens when we don't like everybody? It breaks God's heart. And that's sad, right? So we want to make sure that God's love is shared with everybody. River. Let me see your fingers for a second. Do you like this finger? Yeah? So we probably ought to leave it on there, right? Yeah. <laughs> How about this thumb? You like this thumb? Yeah. We probably ought to leave it on there, right? So if God made the whole body, we probably ought to leave that body together, right? So God made everything or every body. So God loves every body and every piece of the body. Even the ones who are like pinkies and thumbs and big toes. And little piggies. Because we know that little piggies, what do they do? They go wee, 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 wee all the way home, right? Oink, oink. That's right. So God loves everybody. And God wants us to do what? Love everybody. Yeah. Thank you for coming up. Would you all like to have that balloon? Hold on to it tight. All right. Thank you for coming. We will see you next time. Oh, thank you. I love it. Thank you, thank you.
Grace to you in peace from God, our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Last week, we celebrated Valentine's Day, and Emily gave little candy packets to everyone just to remind you how much you are loved. Thank you, Miss Emily. On Valentine's Day, we sprinkle one another with a little bit of love, joy, and cheer. And you may have done it with cards, with flowers, with candy, and other niceties, but the idea was all geared towards showing those that we love just how much we care about them, right? And we all have our favorite love songs. Those songs that are rooted deep in our psyche and, and they kind of connect us to all of those good feelings. I'm reminded of the Beatles, all you need is love. Womp, wa da 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 right? But man, the songs with the word love in the title, they just are seemingly endless, like endless love. And then there's only love can break your heart or the best of my love or whole lot of love and love train. Can't help falling in love. Crazy little thing called love. And you can't buy me love, and I love her. And the list just goes on and on and on. And you probably have your own favorite love songs. Because I know as soon as I said that, your mind started thinking about all your love songs that are, are tucked in there. <coughs> but when it comes to your enemies... You might be thinking more along the line of, what's love got to do with it, got to do with it? And then when you hear the words of Jesus, love hurts. For here, Jesus doesn't pull any punches. And he knows it. This is part still of his Sermon on the Plain from Luke's Gospel. And if you remember, Jesus has been teaching and healing all who came to him. Great crowds have, have gathered around him and longed to touch him for they could feel the power just going out from him. To those who were poor and hungry, and grieving, he offered the blessings of fulfillment. But to those who were rich and full and didn't have a care in the world, he proclaimed a word of warning, a woe, the seriousness of which was very clear. If you imagine that scene, you can almost begin to sense that the crowd is beginning to kind of thin out. Because his words are becoming more and more direct. And sure, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Jesus offers healing through a simple touch. And as soon as they are well, they are free to go and move on with their lives. They got what they came for. No need to stick around. But for those who did, Jesus is now calling them to a different place. And honestly, it's a scary place. And for human beings, it's an unnatural place. He's calling them into a deeper relationship with him that looked much different from the status quo. 
he even begins saying, basically, now if you're still listening, if you're still with me on this, because many have gone away, he says, love your enemies. And this wasn't just any kind of generic love, like, oh, I love everyone kind of love. For those words are easy, especially for people in faith. Oh, we love everybody. Now, this kind of love had real consequences. For Jesus' words go deeper. And they call us, all of us, to stop drawing lines between us and them. But that's what we do, right? The good guys in the white hats and the bad guys in the black hats, the blacks and the whites, the conservatives, the liberal, the right, the left, the rich, the poor, the north, the south, the east, the west, the Carolina versus Duke. But what if these distinctions are ways that we see beauty in particularity? in God's diversity, not as some kind of qualitative value that make them intrinsically different. You see, if there is only us, then there is no enemy. If we are all interconnected to one another and to God, and if all creation and all that is, is related in the love of God, and if all participate in God's love, then we are one. I have wrestled with this text all of my ministry. It's made me feel uncomfortable and reminded me of my sinfulness, my brokenness. For I cannot come to fully love my enemies, to turn the other cheek, to give my shirt to someone who's already stolen my coat. To give to everyone who begs. And you see, that's my sin. My turning inward on myself. It's, frankly, it's what I was taught to do all my life. To look out after number one. Because if you don't look out after number one, no one else will. And guess who number one is? <laughs> it's me. And if I'm number one, you aren't. The problem is God is number one. And we've yet to come to realize the truth of that statement. It is precisely God who is calling us to a new way. So lately, I've been looking at this a little bit differently. What makes someone my enemy? Why would I choose to hate another person? Is it not because of the perceived differences between us? Me versus you and you versus me and us versus them? You know, and I so desperately want to blame the other to maintain my self. But is that ultimately what we are called to be about? Self-preservation? 
Nowhere in scripture do I see that. I have to admit that every ounce of me trembles at this text. For if Jesus is truly calling me to love my enemies, my haters, then he's calling me to be vulnerable, to trust God, and to be truly faithful. And frankly, that's terrifying. Anyone who has ever said that discipleship is easy, just follow Jesus, has never taken this passage seriously. But the more I think about it, the onus of this is not on me or on my enemy. The onus of this is on God. And God promises to be faithful. So we are told to do to others as we would have them do to us. Or the golden rule. Or in other words, we are to treat people the way we want to be treated. The way God wants us to treat each other. Not based on how we feel about them or on how we have been treated. Here I've been reminded of the civil rights movement of the 1960s, a non-retaliative, non-violent response to the way our black and brown sisters and brothers and anyone who supported them were treated, beaten, hosed, attacked by dogs, lynched, worse, Looking back at actual film footage, accounts of the marches, I am amazed at how they were able to embrace Jesus' teaching. So Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, Violence begets violence. Hate begets hate. And toughness begets greater toughness. And it's all a descending spiral. And the end is destruction for everybody. Along the way of life, someone must have enough sense and morality to cut off the chain of hate. And again, in one of his most famous sermons, Loving Your Enemies, on this text, Dr. King preached, Returning for hate, for hate multiplies hate. Adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Echoing the heart of Jesus, Dr. King put his faith and his life on the line. And he was martyred in the process for his faith, for taking Jesus seriously. Yet ultimately, God had the last word. You see, love is not just a warm, fuzzy feeling reserved for those closest to our hearts. Love is a commitment, a deep dive into the heart of God. Love is what God extended to us as Jesus went to the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes on him may not perish but have everlasting life. In love, 
God offered life. And in this life, God calls us to offer love in real and concrete ways, in doing good, in giving, expecting nothing in return, in being kind and merciful. That is the life to which we have been called. And then comes the really hard question. Is that the life that we are living for God's sake and for the sake of the world? So then, what's love got to do with it? Everything. Absolutely everything. Amen.
The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance. In abundance. So we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. You teach us to love our neighbors and enemies alike. Encourage your church to follow the leading of your love, especially when it is risky or difficult. Help us to show mercy just as we have first received mercy. God of grace. Nurture fields that lie dormant, resting until it is time to bloom again. Bless farmers and all who cultivate fields and urban gardens. Give favorable weather for planting. Bring forth from buried seed an abundant harvest and guard against famine and disease. God of grace. Look upon our world with mercy, that we delight in an abundance of peace. Protect all whose lives are marred by war and civil unrest. Release political prisoners and amplify the voices that challenge us to seek forgiveness and pursue nonviolence. God of grace. Your people cry out for mercy. Console hearts that long for forgiveness. Mend broken relationships. Heal bodies that suffer chronic pain or illness. Strengthen and deliver all whose spirits are troubled, especially for those we name in our hearts before you now. God of grace, you bind us together into one family. Teach us to forgive one another and to resolve conflicts with humility and patience. Bless families of all shapes and sizes and show love to those who are lonely or grieving. God of grace. We praise you for the saints who have inherited the fullness of your kingdom. As you have raised them to imperishable and eternal life, sustain us in faith by the promise of resurrection. God of grace.
forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The body of Christ given for you. Amen. The blood of sake of the 